because we have been so open, because we have erred towards letting a thousand flowers bloom in terms of expression and, and supported anonymity. It has also allowed for really bad actors to manipulate the information space. That is again, like one of the variables that we have not figured out how we feel about it, how to reconcile it with the principles that we believe we built the infrastructure on. I'm Quinta Jurassic, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, December 9th, 2021. We're bringing you another episode today of Arbiters of Truth, our series on the online information ecosystem. We talk a lot about how content moderation involves a lot of hard decisions and trade-offs. But at the end of the day, someone has to make a call about what stays on a platform and what comes down. So this week, Evelyn Dueck and I spoke with The Decider. Nicola Wong, who earned that tongue-in-cheek nickname during her time at Google in the 2000s. As the company's deputy general counsel, Nicole was in charge of decision-making over what content Google should remove or keep up in response to complaints from users and governments alike. Since then, she moved on to roles as Twitter's legal director of products and the deputy chief technology officer of the United States under the Obama administration. And the role of social media platforms in shaping society has grown enormously. But how much have content moderation debates really changed in the meantime? We talked to Nicole about her time as the decider, what has changed and what stayed the same since the early days of content moderation, and how her thinking about the danger and promise of the internet has changed over the years. It's the Lawfare Podcast, December 9th. Content Moderation's Original Decider. So, Nicole, you've had a lot of pretty impressive and intimidating titles, not least, of course, Deputy Chief Technology Officer of the United States in the Obama administration. And we will come back to that. But I think I have to start with what is probably the coolest title of any Arbiter's guest, uh, which is The Decider. So (laughs) in... 2012, Jeffrey Rosen wrote that until recently, the person who had more power to determine who may speak and who may be heard around the world was not a president or king or Supreme Court justice. She was Nicole Wong, who was deputy general counsel at Google until her recent resignation. Her colleagues called her the decider. So first, uh, that's awesome. And second... (laughs) You were deciding things well before content moderation was a well-known phrase. Um, Do you remember the moment or time when you realized the enormity of the power that was falling to you? And like, was the, the nickname born of a particular decision? Do you remember when you found yourself becoming the decider and deciding things? (laughs) <laughs> Jeffrey Rosen's article has had such staying power in my world. And um, and I always have to sort of clarify, I'm like, the decider was a, it was mostly a joke um, that people were like, oh, well, Nicole's got to decide. So that makes her the decider. And it was in the context, I think, of at the time, George W. Bush was being called the decider. So, so there was a good bit of uh, tongue in cheek <laughs> when people referred to me as that. It was back, and this was a, a New York Times Magazine article that, that came out um, that Jeff wrote about the process of content moderation with a focus on Google and the decisions we were making in so many different services, right? In, in our YouTube service, in our blogger service, and in the search service. Those were really early decisions from the context of being like a global platform with obligations around the world. That was the first time I had had to do that at that level of scale. But I always tell people like, you know, like the decider is really the person who just kind of convenes everyone else who's helping to make the decision. And and so in that role, I think what my, my purpose was is to take a piece of content that someone had complained about. Usually when it had escalated to me, it was a, a government um, that was complaining and then find all the stakeholders in the company. So that might be like the product manager responsible for YouTube, the sales lead responsible in that country where it was in dispute, the the local council who who would have a view on the local laws. So so trying to get everyone together, including our public policy colleagues and our communications colleagues, to decide what the right course would be. And having laid all of that out, driving a decision. I've later learned that there are actually like 
big consulting companies that have turned just into a process that they market to companies for decision making. Um, but to me, it was just it was the most effective way to make sure that we were touching base with all the people who are going to be impacted by a decision that would have ramifications in their country or for their product. How did it feel to kind of have that power, even if you're saying, you know, you're not the one who's personally making the decisions, but you are <laughs> convening the people who are talking about how to make those decisions. And I think it's, you know, it's it's easy to sit on the outside criticizing the choices that people who are in your role today are making. And we've we've done plenty of that on this podcast, but I don't envy the responsibility of making that choice because they're often really hard decisions with far reaching consequences. And it's very easy to Monday morning quarterback, but perhaps harder to to quarterback in the moment. On the other hand, you know, I imagine there is something that's kind of cool about having this very direct way in which you can make a difference in the world. So how did you personally think about it? I personally thought about it as, I, I think your starting point is what are the principles you're operating under, right? Like what's our mission with this product in this country, right? So you start from sort of what are we doing here? And, and who do we owe a responsibility to? And I think when I was at Google and at Twitter, I feel really fortunate that those companies in the time that I was there, like was very focused on your user is the person you're trying to serve. And that's how I usually started the inquiry. I'm like, well, what do I need to know in order to make that happen? It, it raises questions about like, what government am I under? What, what, what scheme of judicial uh, review am I under? Um, who else has a, has a stake in, in this decision? And I took that really seriously. I believed in the mission. I believed in, in trying to do those decisions with as, as much input to have as much information as I could. What that often meant, because my responsibilities were global, because we were a global company, it meant that I did a lot of things until from early in the morning until very late at night. Um, I used to joke with someone like, you know, my calls would start with Europe five or six in the morning and, and go until, you know, I hit the office by nine. And then the Asia calls would usually start around five or six in the evening and go until however late they needed to go for Asia. So like, it's an exhausting thing when, when you're in a young company who hasn't kind of divided up regionally. But one of the things that I thought was the most gratifying thing to me was actually being able to look at things globally and, and look at them for both the consistency of our actions, but also the principles with which we were conducting ourselves globally. I say that as, as someone who is trained as a First Amendment lawyer, right? And so the work that I did on behalf of a lot of internet companies over the years, but but in particular at Google, which was such a global company in the time that we were there, it caused me to reevaluate, like, what is our appropriate position in the area of speech and privacy? And, and how do we effectuate our, our goals and, and, and our mission? Yeah, I think that interplay between the First Amendment and global law and what other countries think about free speech is really a huge theme of uh, of sort of the story of content moderation. I think we'll return to it often in our conversation today. But one of the things that really struck me in preparing for this interview and reading some of the articles about you from the you know 2000s and 2010s is it kind of feels like everything old is new again. There's sort of this big deja vu, um, you know, the kinds of issues that you were dealing with then, as you mentioned, you know, these these requests from governments to take down content. And these articles we're talking about are the governments of Thailand and Turkey blocking YouTube because of videos that they found offensive. I mean, those stories could be ripped straight from the headlines today, almost word for word. But at the same time, there's sort of all these warning sounds right now about the rise of digital authoritarianism because of all of this pressure on social media companies to take down content. So I'm curious how you feel about that. Like, do you just have this sort of recurrent sense of deja vu and, oh, here we go again, around and around? Or do you think there is something new? Has has much changed since since you were doing it? Yeah, lots of things have changed. And, and I would say much for the better in a lot of ways. And, and then some that are just like frightening, right? And, and at the crux of some of our our deepest issues today in, in terms of regulation. But you're right, right? Like some of the things that we're dealing with don't look any different than they did 10, 15 years ago. It's content that's annoying somebody in some country and, and there's going to be a dispute about it. And, and I guess just to take a step back and, and I've talked about this in, in the past, which is 
you know, if you think about the evolution of how these, what we now call platforms, what like back in the late nineties, they called the information superhighway, And for like a hot minute, it was like new media. <laughs> these, these platforms, you know, were largely for the first decade of commercial internet, really in the laboratory of Western democracies, right? Really mostly in the United States, the UK, some Western European countries, Australia, Canada, Japan. And that was it for like a really long time. And what you have from that is that like you had a legal regime, which was at least similar in its approach to privacy and freedom of expression. There was rule of law that kind of looked similar. There were some differences, but largely looked similar in terms of how you vindicate those values under law. And so a lot of the early growth of the internet came in that space. I'll add, and we can talk about this later, right? That was also largely an internet that was built and developed by and for mostly men, mostly white men, mostly college educated white men. Right. So, and, and, that, and that's, that's a different part of the conversation. Um, I think that as, as we hit like the mid 2000s, internet penetration was really successful in a bunch of other countries that were not like that first generation of countries. So China, Russia, Turkey, Thailand, um, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, and India, of course, a bunch of countries that were either authoritarian or really young democracies where the muscle around privacy and freedom of expression rights was much, much less developed. And that to me is where things started to really change in terms of, and, and that we're, we're still trying to work through now. So what I think is the same is we're still having these disputes over things we disagree about as different cultures. And again, I'll layer onto that you know, communities of color and women and LGBTQ communities who have also gotten much more active in, in the internet space, that we haven't figured out a way to resolve those. And as much as technology has advanced, it has not solved those social disagreements or political disagreements. So the things that we haven't worked on, like we can keep advancing in, with technology, and with more processes, we can even put some more laws in place. But until we make decisions about how we feel about people who believe in things differently than we do, <laughs> we're not going to make that much progress, right? <laughs> or we're going to keep coming into these conflict zones. So there's so much to dig into there. But before we do, I, I want to follow up on what you said about how some of the developments in recent years have been frightening. Can you expand on that? What do you have in mind there? Yeah, I think... You know, I, I I would put myself in in the generation of folks who first came to the growth of the internet with a lot of optimism and and a lot of belief of like we're going to create the most democratized platform for access to information and publishing and expression ever, right? It'll be fabulous. And I think that I vastly underestimated how that that openness would get turned around. And by that, I mean that because we have been so open, because we have erred towards letting a thousand flowers bloom in terms of expression and, and supported anonymity, which by the way, I also agree with as, as a, a mode for communication. It has also allowed for really bad actors to manipulate the information space. And I think that that is again, like, one of the variables that we have not figured out how we feel about it, how to reconcile it with the principles that we believe we built the infrastructure on. So let's go back to this idea then of American companies, intrinsically American companies with American lawyers steeped in the First Amendment, who are then in, in charge of global communications, and they run smack head on into other countries who have very different uh, ideas of free speech, for better or for worse. I mean, listeners can tell my accent. You know, I come from a very different <laughs> free speech culture than the First Amendment. And, I mean, my impression, and, and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, or certainly reading these early Rosen pieces, right, is that, well, the rest of the world's got it wrong. Um, clearly, the First Amendment 
n- not from you, uh, but just like this general sort of feeling uh, uh, that Americans have of like American free speech is the truest, most purest form of free speech. And these other countries, uh, legal systems are sort of uh, threatening that conception. And I think that that sort of sentiment is still reflected in, in in some current debates. But I also think that in the last half decade, perhaps, there's been more openness to the idea that perhaps the remedy for bad speech isn't always more speech. And that, you know, sometimes, uh, particularly, you know, when it's private corporations and not governments making the rules, that there should be room for thinking about uh, mitigating the harms of, of speech. And so I'm wondering about your experience very early on. Um, like you said, you practiced First Amendment law before you were at Google. How was that experience of sort of coming from this tradition, which, uh, you know, as a foreigner that has come to America, I don't know where it is in the sort of educational system that Americans sort of get infused or sort of indoctrinated in First Amendment culture, but it seems very early. Like, I don't know if it's in the in the water supply or something, um, but it's really like such a cultural conception of the the First Amendment that that dominates over here, how it was going from that culture to suddenly deciding the rules for all these other countries. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's a bunch embedded in in sort of the mythology around the First Amendment. And mythology is probably the wrong word, but I I think that like the notion of the marketplace of ideas, right? And I, I think a presumption by a lot of people that free speech will work in favor of the little guy, that the reason we want lots of access to new voices and to not silence anyone is this notion that there will be some oppressed minority that we'll, we'll miss if, if we don't give them the space to speak. And I, I by the way, believe that's still true. But I, I think that if you look at like some of the frames in which the early internet folks first encountered limitations on speech. So think about the Yahoo France case that came really early, right, where France told Yahoo it would be illegal for them to um, have Nazi memorabilia in their marketplace in France. And there was a huge court battle, social battle around who was right, France or the United States in terms of free speech and whether it was okay for Nazi memorabilia to be in the marketplace and all like that was that was a real conversation which in today's world seems like yeah okay that maybe that's right right but I think most places are now blocking a lot of Nazi memorabilia but that was a really contentious one I think it was the same with Germany had sort of a black box law that I, I believe they still implement, but I, I bet the technical aspects of it are different. In the early days, it was they had a an agency that was sort of hooked with a self-regulatory body to prohibit certain content being made accessible, particularly to children. So it would be very violent content, but also Nazi-related content had to be blocked. And, and Absolutely, in the United States, the companies who were told, yeah, you're going to have to download that set of URLs from Germany and make sure you're blocking them and all your service, felt really offensive. Felt like, you want me to block Mein Kampf, but Mein Kampf is a historical document. Why shouldn't we have conversation around things like that? Those are still conversations we're having today, but with a pretty different lens than we had it in the late 90s. And I think that that's a change of who we are and some of the harms that we've seen to come. You know, over the course of my work over the last 20 years, I was never a dogmatic First Amendment person, but I did believe in it. And I think that the thing, some of the like conceptual things that, that have changed are a notion that sometimes more speech is used to flood the zone to block out voices or to scare some voices off a platform. And that weaponization of speech, in my experience, was new um, and is different and requires a different set of tools than than we currently have. I'm not sure that we've really resolved how we're gonna manage that stuff, but I think it's a really important understanding of how to maintain speech for as much of the community as you can. 
I completely agree with that. And I also, you know, as a free speech scholar, really believe that, you know, freedom of expression is is really important for the little guys and often is for the benefit of uh, minorities and, and marginalized communities. And I guess the worry is in trying to mitigate some of the harms of the sort of early internet era that we overreact and go too far in the opposite direction. But I suppose that's often the way these things work and that there's cycles and, and overcorrections and swings back and, and, and things like that. I well, I guess I I hope we get there <laughs> where the cycle yeah. happens. I do feel like we're at this really like difficult convergence, right? Of like an enormous amount of pressure from a lot of different sectors about like do more, looking directly at the tech sector, do more to contain bad actors and bad speech, right? And at the same time, that there is a really worthwhile conversation around who gets to decide that. If we go back to sort of what I was talking about before, like the decision makers were unquestionably in the frame of mostly white, mostly college educated men. <laughs> and if we if we decide, hey, maybe they're not the right decision makers or the decider to, to use the word that was given to me at the beginning, right, then who's supposed to do that? And I feel like the demand to make decisions at the same time that we are questioning who gets to make decisions has come at the same time. And that's that's a very difficult space to operate either a product or a policy making process in. So I want to ask you about sort of how we think about the way that decision making itself has changed, because I think your your framing makes a lot of sense to me. And you were asked in 2008, um, and again, we're studying this piece by Jeffrey Rosen about whether whether the decider model was sustainable. And you said no which Rosen says that he was surprised by, which I found really interesting. So what what made you say that? Um, staying up way too many nights. Physically unsustainable, not legally, <laughs> theoretically, just like there was not enough yeah. coffee in the world. <laughs> it was literally like, there is not a single person in the world who can do this for many, many years over time. And, right, like, how do you have how do you build norms and consensus with this sort of like one company makes decisions here and another company makes decisions here? Like, like at some point we have to kind of bring it all together and decide on what our norms are. And I felt like the, the every company gets its own decider was as a practical matter hard and maybe was not going to be the right model. And by the way, I'm not sure that I'm right on the last part of it. Like, like, I do think every company needs to have someone who's making decisions for them. I think the question is, what forum do we have to evaluate those decisions and against what set of principles or metrics? That, to me, is the work that's going on now, right? That's the experimentation with the Facebook Oversight Board, or I was listening to your podcast earlier, like Zoom has an internal one. I think many companies have, like, an internal sort of decision-making body. And so... I think the question is like how do we how do we get to a place where we agree that certain norms exist around content and privacy and and who's at the table for that? Yeah, so that that's a good segue to my next question, which is I, I feel like there's a kind of a narrative appeal in the idea of a single person making those decisions, whether or not it's both physically and intellectually sustainable. And what I mean by that is that I think there's a very common sort of political story, at least in the the Western tradition, which is the one I'm the most familiar with, where there's one person, usually though not always a man, who sort of takes the world on his shoulders and makes these difficult calls that nobody else has the knowledge or the guts to make and end up, ends up becoming sort of a tragic figure. And I think we we see this in tech. You know, I always think of the example of Matthew Prince, the CEO of Cloudflare, removing service from the neo-Nazi website Stormfront in 2017 after the violence in Charlottesville and essentially allowing the site to be booted off the web and then publishing this very sort of anguished blog post about whether or not he should have made that decision. Or more recently, I, I also think you see shades of this in erstwhile Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey's tweets about how he thought really hard about whether or not to remove Trump from Twitter 
is it fair to say that there's sort of an appeal to this image of the the lone decider? Um, and I guess if if you think there is, how do we move past that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there is an appeal. I, I guess it comes from two ends. One is like, if you have the right person with the right set of like moral backbone, then it's like, oh, that's the hero of your story, right? To have made those calls. And I think that's a really brittle way to try and build a whole communications platform for the world, <laughs> for all the practical and philosophical reasons we kind of were talking about. But but I see the narrative. And then I what I also see, I think, in, in the political forum, right, is like Congress wants somebody to haul in front of them to explain what they did. And so there is a political expediency to having one person who will be responsible for a choice. I don't think it should be surprising to anyone that Matthew or Jack or I in that New York Times article said, like, we don't actually want to carry this um, by ourselves. Like, we think that governments, particularly those who are democratically elected, should be in a better position to decide what is appropriate for for public discourse rather than a single CEO. Now, they're like, you could weigh that against a, a different um, option, right? Which is that we are far more supportive of an information ecosystem that has many, many players um, so that no single platform has quite that much control or influence so that it, it is literally like lots of people making lots, lots of decisions about information and, and where you get it. Um, and in that scenario, it matters less that there's one person responsible because everybody who has their small blog, right, is responsible. Um, that's not the world we live in currently. And, and that's, a, that's a choice that we're making from a policy perspective. Yeah, I like to call it the content moderation hot potato, which is like everyone would be quite happy, I think, if somebody else could make that decision for them. Like Quinta said earlier, I much prefer to sit in this chair and critique everyone that's making the decisions uh, because it would be, uh, I think, impossible. These are really, really hard calls. And I think that's what you see in a number of these CEOs write, you know, writing op-eds and calling for regulation saying, please just tell us what you want us uh, to take down. And then on the other hand, you have legislatures who who are yelling at tech execs to do better, but often not really specifying exactly uh, what that means. And and you sort of were mentioning this before when you were saying, you know, that Congress likes to have someone to to pull in um, and to put in the in the hot seat. And I want to ask a little bit about that because you yourself have appeared before Congress a number of times. Maybe back when it got a little less attention. Now it seems to be a regular occurrence and a bit of a circus. It gets uh, plenty of press coverage. But, you know, having watched most of them, I think, uh, over the past couple of years, uh, there seems to be very little that, that tends to come from them. And I'm wondering, you know, what you think of the quality of these hearings and whether they've gotten better or worse. Because on, on the one hand, maybe they should have gotten better as uh, lawmakers sort of learn more about the the industry that they are sort of, you know, having the hearings about. Um, but on the other hand, you know, this is becoming so politicized and partisan that there's, you know, an increased amount of, of grandstanding um, and looking for sound bites. So I'm curious, you know, what you think of the, the hearings, how they've sort of changed over time and, and what you see as the point of them. Yeah, those are such good questions. And, and I think, it, let me answer it in two parts. One is just sort of like the savviness of the hearings in my experience over the last 15 years or so. And I think the first time I testified was like maybe 2004, like a really long time ago. I'm now like letting you know how very old I am. Um, but it was like, it was a subcommittee on the constitution for the House Judiciary Committee. And I was testifying on the internet and the constitution. And the particular question was about surveillance. This is 2004. So like a really long time ago. And some of the questions were like really bad. And I know that, you know, we've continued to sort of pick at senators who have been asking bad questions in the last couple of years. 
you know, from talking about the pipes to not knowing what the ad model looks like for Facebook, like all that stuff, they were really much worse before. Oh, no. <laughs> really, oh, wow. <laughs> really, really much worse. Um, and, and I remember in one hearing, you know, having to write very slowly explain what an IP address is. It, it, so, so I think l- let's take as good news. Congress has gotten better at honing the questions around these hearings. They have in particular gotten better at staffing themselves with legislative aides and, and experts in their offices who are knowledgeable. And that is an enormous difference from where we have been before. And, and, and I say that knowing that not every senator or congressperson has has uh, represented themselves well in some of these hearings, but they really are better. So, so th- there's that. I think in terms of what are these four you need to think about, you know, a congressional hearing is in part about oversight, in part about sort of informing the public about some an issue, and in part about policy making, but usually not that much on the latter. And and what I mean by that is like there's almost never a hearing where all of a sudden we get a new law built out of it. Right, because that's not how these questions go. Usually, you get five minutes to to present your oral testimony, and and that's not nearly enough for issues as complex as what we've been talking about here: privacy and and security and and content uh, moderation issues. Not nearly enough to start to cover how would we regulate in this space. Um, so, so I think that like if you put aside, oh, we're going to develop a law, and think more about what is the public function of these hearings. I think one of them is genuinely to like educate both the public and in some cases the legislators about a particular issue. And that does serve a purpose uh, because there's now a record, right, that that we can put in front of folks. I think that what we've mostly seen, particularly with the set of like CEO testimony before Congress, which are unusual up until just a few years ago, it, it would never be the CEO from a tech company that showed up. It was always a VP or a public policy head or something like that. I think that what the representatives and, and senators are seeking is trying to get a commitment out of the company about a position or something they will do. And in the best case scenario, it is a commitment made publicly that you can then go look back at and hold them accountable for having done or not done. I think that we do very poorly on the follow-up in the most cases. Instead, there's a lot more spectacle about being able to ask people hard questions that make them um, embarrassed, as opposed to actually trying to get real information with real commitments. Is there anything that springs to mind that you think Congress should do or could do to increase its capacity in this area? I mean, like you say, it does strike me that however erratic the quality of tech hearings is currently, they're just leaps and bounds better than they were even in in 2017. And yet you do still end up with senators and representatives going down sort of weird alleyways or not quite understanding things. As someone who's who served in both government and has worked in the technology industry, are there obvious things that Congress can do to improve or are the limitations you identify inherent to the fact that it's Congress and at the end of the day, many members and senators are looking for that soundbite and looking for that commitment to try to hold a representative of a company to? Yeah, I mean, I think so, so some are slow and some are fast. Some the slow ones are like let's let's staff better. Um, let's have more staff who understand technology, ask the right questions, can formulate policy to support uh, a senator or representative that's that's interested in that area or who needs to understand that area. So that's one. The other, I think, has been talked about quite frequently, and and I can't remember the name of what it was previously called, but like the Office of Technology Assessment. I think something like that in yeah, the Congress, that's, that's which basically the served, right, it served as like a, a clearinghouse of information for senators and representatives to get smart about technology so that they would walk in with a certain amount of information already that they didn't have to rely on 
a lobbyist to tell them, right? Um, and and it helps them form better questions. And I think that that would be enormously useful. I, I am very much an advocate for like bringing more technical expertise into government at all levels. And, and so I think that for the Congress in particular, that will be important. I think it's important in the agencies, right? So that they are delivering their services with like the best possible technology. I think that's important for the policy bodies from like the National Security Council to the Domestic Policy Council to the NEC to have, and, and they do, by the way, in, in the current Biden administration, they are hiring really well of, of people with, with a great deal of expertise in tech to then make better policy. So let's then talk in a little bit more detail about that other very cool and impressive title that you have had, which is the Deputy Chief Technology Officer of the United States. I'm curious what the experience was like going from the private sector where you were for for so long and then going to the other side of the table and joining government and what the biggest surprise was for you, you know, from how you perceived government from being the regulated or perhaps not so regulated uh, entity and then going into government and, and, you know, being on the other side of the table, what do you think is the biggest misconception about government from uh, the private entity side and vice versa? Let's see, that's a big question. <laughs> so, so I think probably a huge misconception that continues to persist in a lot of the tech sector is that government is monolithic as in like one part if one part of government says something the rest of government agrees that's simply not the case and you and you can imagine that like the federal trade commission is going to have one position on privacy and the appropriate use of data the department of justice is going to have a different position on it probably and, and it could be the intelligence community also has a different position so like there there are many different parts of government all of which you need to understand like what's their expertise and what's their stake in any given particular issue so i think that's one i think there's also reforming but but had been a long-standing trope about government that like it's a bunch of bureaucrats who don't really care that was never my experience at, at any level of the government that I interacted with in, in the time that I served. There are enormously dedicated professionals with huge amounts of expertise who could be making enormous amounts of money in the private sector, but choose to serve the American public. And they are just the most phenomenal group of people to work with. So it was my absolute privilege to get to be one of their colleagues for, for a brief period on really hard issues. I, I think that one of the things that I, I talk to people about when when I am encouraging a group to to enter government is is that if you're looking to make an impact, right? Sure, you can make it, you know, launching that new app, <laughs> or you could make sure that millions of people get their social security checks on time, right? You could make sure that millions of veterans get their benefits on time, that you solve portions of food insecurity for millions of families around the country. That's impact. And, and I think that the tech sector underestimates how much work is getting done by our government, not, and not just the tech sector. I think the public underestimates how much is getting done by our government, by really devoted public servants. And what about uh, misconceptions by the, the government about tech? I think that for a long time, they thought the tech sector was just building toys, <laughs> right? Like things that they didn't really have to pay attention to or things that they could isolate as a sector, right? It's like, oh, you're just the tech sector um, in the same way we think about the agricultural sector. And I think what has now come to pass is everything is tech, whether you're in agriculture or uh, telecommunications or medicine, you're using tech and you're using data. And so I think that the government has had to really ramp up both in terms of how it conceives of a sector, but also how it looks at innovation in the sector in order to keep pace with it. So to move from a conversation maybe about where government and tech are in opposition uh, when it comes to sort of regulation domestically to an area where they 
could be and perhaps should be more uh, playing on the same team, which is sort of internationally, as we see governments around the world cracking down on free speech, as we were sort of talking about earlier, and, and pressuring platforms to take content down. Um, something that I've found quite frustrating in this sort of context is the US government's silence um, on a lot of this and sort of leaving private platforms to fend for themselves against very powerful authoritarian or quasi-authoritarian governments. And it really seems to me that the US government could help um, or change the conversation or the tone of the conversation a little bit by giving platforms some cover or at least support. For example, you know, by speaking out when the Indian government you know, pressures and intimidates Twitter into taking down what is basically core political speech. And I'm just curious how you would think about that, you know, when you were the decider. Um, I imagine that kind of support and backing would have been welcome and, and potentially useful and, and would have factored into your decision making. Is that is that correct? And then I guess, do you think there's any particular reason why we're not seeing the US government come in and, you know, helping these American companies who are receiving so much pressure overseas from other governments uh, to take down content when there is so much critique of these companies for not standing up for freedom of expression. But again, you know, there's a lot of sympathy for the people within the companies who are facing this governmental pressure from other governments. And without uh, US government support, it seems like an, a very big ask for them to be the ones to stand up to that pressure. Yes you're perceiving something that's that's really right and is not new i think for as long as i can think of internet companies and, and crossing jurisdictional lines with their with their uh content right we've always had these issues and and we have turned to the federal government for support now just to to be clear sometimes that support is better when it's quiet than when it's noisy and so there's a strategic decision about how can government be most effective for, for a company? Is it a noisy thing or a, or a quiet thing? I will say that like in the time that uh, Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, her internet freedom speech was a, just a triumph for companies who had to go out there and try and defend certain principles around the world, which, which were getting challenged around both free expression and privacy. That level, and, and the clarity of the message was really important um, and something that we all hung on to quite a bit. You know, I, I joined uh, the Obama administration in June of 2013, which was the month that the Snowden disclosure started. And, and I don't know, when you serve in government, they usually say like, have three priorities that you're gonna do. Cause you know, crises will make you like depart from your priorities. You gotta keep in mind what really matters to you. And so have three. And going in, because I had made the decision to join in like January of 2013, I was like, I think I'll do internet governance because that's really important to me. I'll do free expression, you know, kind of riding on, on the wind of, of that Clinton speech. And maybe I'll do some privacy. <laughs> and when I arrived in June of 2013, a week after the Snowden disclosures, no one was going to talk about anything with us except privacy and surveillance, right? That was not going to be a conversation. And there, and there was, when you look back on that, there was no way for the United States to have a conversation on anything related to the internet other than that. Like we had to resolve our, our, our position that we aren't gonna talk about free expression. <laughs> we weren't gonna talk about trade tariffs. We weren't gonna talk about anything else, right? Or governance. Like we had to resolve our position on, on privacy and surveillance. And I think that that was appropriate. But it tells you something about like, when can a government step into a conversation and when is it useful? Like when are they have positive force in doing so? I want to go back to what you mentioned, Hillary Clinton's famous speech about internet freedom, which I think was in 2010, and sort of trace that way of thinking about the internet through the Snowden revelations and then through to today. Because it strikes me that you can maybe tell a story about the turn against the kind of the optimism of the early internet that you have, as you say, you know, this really important speech by Clinton about the importance of internet freedom. And then the Snowden revelations are arguably, you can sort of argue that in terms of the promise of the internet or its danger, but it certainly begins a period of real tension between technology companies and the U.S. government. And then, of course, now 
we're in a space where I think there's a lot of frustration and upset <laughs> with what the internet has become on on all sides. People are struggling to figure out how to cooperate if they want to cooperate. I'm curious if you think that that story that I just told is is accurate and whether you think that there's any possibility of returning to that kind of 2010 era optimism. Are we pessimists for good? <laughs> How about cautious optimists? Is, can we be that? I'll take it. <laughs> I think, so, so just to remember the context of 2010, right? Because that was actually when I was doing a lot of my more policy oriented work for Google, because that was when Google decided to withdraw from China, right? But it was also, it was a period where we were kind of at the crux of that conflict that I described earlier between first generation internet principles and second generation country internet principles. In 2009, Google alone and its range of services from Blogger to YouTube to search, right, were being blocked in 25 countries. And, and that was such a, a devastating thing to our sort of mission around openness and, and access to information. That that's the reason that the Clinton speech resonated so much with us. It's like, we want everyone to have access to all of this stuff. And I think that that's the optimism about what the internet could have been or could be, is that type of a platform. And, and the wake up call with our decision to withdraw from China not only because we were facing increasing censorship on the search engine, but also real security concerns around breaches of security for users in China and outside of China, that we decided to withdraw, that it was no longer a tenable market to, to play in. And I think that that was a wake up call that we all had to contend with that sort of a force and a state backed force at that to deal with. I do think, you know, as as we travel through the Snowden moment, um, where we start to really question what is the role that our own government is playing in this country and around the world uh, in terms of the the harnessing of technology, that was a second point uh, to take it. And and I think that I think you're right, uh, Quinto, that like the current moment is like we're dealing with both foreign state actors. And then just like rogue agents within our services that we don't know how to manage and we don't know who's going to be in charge of, of holding them accountable. Like, is it supposed to be the companies? Is there not a law somewhere in some country that's supposed to hold those people accountable? That strikes me as the mess we're currently in. I am hopeful that we find our way out of that. We'll see, right? Like maybe the, the Summit for Democracy that, that's coming up will be the start of a conversation around how do we think about that as a global um, matter. But it's it's a really long road. Like we have to think on really long time horizons, I think, to deal with this. At the same time, I will say that like, there's a whole new community gaining momentum around, I hear it variously referred to as Web3 and decentralized web and the crypto blockchain community, right? Like whatever you decide to call them, they have that same optimism around who they're for and, and, and what they're for, that I, you know, I think they're a place to watch. Like, how are they going to govern themselves? Right now, a lot of the conversation I think is around, there will be, you know, governance through DAOs. <laughs> I just, I'm, I, I, I'm not sure what, what we'll see come out of that. Yes, but but the stories are fun, at least. They are um, fun. <laughs> you know, so uh, I want to go back to something you were saying earlier about the background conditions for a lot of the disputes and, and issues that, that tech has to deal with that can't be resolved by technology. So you recently wrote in a piece for the Knight Foundation that we, particularly policymakers, the media and the public, need to recognise the wider social societal dynamics that tech did not create and cannot fix. The disconnect and rancor expressed on social media today is not the simple product of internet trolls, filter bubbles or opaque algorithms, but is rooted in our fundamental failure to deliver on the real needs of the country. I completely agree with that sentiment and it often feels like we focus on 
content moderation or tech platforms as the cure for a lot of our ills because you know it's it's right there in front of us it's literally the 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 visual manifestation of so many of these problems on our screens um and it sort of feels like from the outside isn't there just someone in that company that can push a button isn't there a decider that can make this go away but i'd love for you to unpack that a little bit more what what you meant by that and why you think it's happening that the internet is getting blamed for these issues that just seem so incredibly broad and and it would be amazing if there were a button to fix these issues but it seems so improbable and i'm wondering what you think creates that dynamic yeah i mean like this is the the tough question of our time right like i think why do we keep looking for tech solutionism in these really hard socio political problems in part I think it's because like you can isolate it and and because you know tech has been so phenomenal about making things very immediate right so that everything's like right in front of you and you're like well that's the cause of why i'm feeling badly then that's where i should focus my my energy in trying to fix it um so that's that's one dimension of of the problem i think the second dimension honestly is is tech's own fault And, and i say this also in the same piece which is like Tech has a way of saying being very optimistic about what it can do. And and maybe because like their executives are super used to selling themselves to VCs, like they're going to change the world, which they have. But sometimes they promise a whole lot. And we need to get really good about being crisp on what we cannot solve. There are things that AI should be in no way near to solving. <laughs> we shouldn't want it to be making those choices for us. We shouldn't, we shouldn't think it's a solution. And but but tech executives, especially when they get you know confronted by angry Congress people, say like, well, we'll just add some more AI to that and solve it. And and that's not the right answer because it's a bigger question than that. So so I think why do we focus on tech? Part of it is because of how tech is so integrated in, in our lives in a very immediate way. And part of it is because of the mythology that tech creates for itself about what it can and can't do. And and when I was talking about there are things it can't do, I think there are things it can't do, and I think there are th- things we will, should not want it to do. So I think the things that it can't do, it can't solve inequality that breeds people to be at odds with each other over real things, right? It cannot solve the problem of lacking an understanding of who's in charge and who has authority and what is true, like that actually has to be a reinvigoration of really good journalism at a local level that proves itself over time. It's a whole bunch of things about our ecosystem, about how we get information and and digest information that's healthy for civic conversation. I also think honestly, like our institutions and particularly our government institutions haven't delivered to us a bunch of stuff that makes us not believe in government anymore, not believe in authority anymore. So we're going to resort to our community uh, on Facebook or our, our, our followers on Twitter instead as, as our source of truth and how we frame belief and what, what we think about COVID and, and, and its transmission, right? Like we're just not delivering fast enough at speed with what government should be offering. So I think that there's there's that. I don't have a solution though, right? In pointing all of that out, I don't think there's a silver bullet solution to making all of that better. I think it's a hard problem. And I think it's a problem that is, it, my hope is like starts with very local trust structures and then expands. And by that, I mean like start with really good local journalism where you know that you can count on certain types of reporting because you see it in your community expand that to how it you know then impacts how you create policy for your community see if that model will work as it builds over time from small communities into states and into into regions is that a way forward i'm not sure but like it feels better than just sort of throwing up your hands and saying we can't trust anything anymore Let's leave it on that note. Nicole, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. I'm such a fan of this podcast and just delighted to join both of you. You've been listening to Arbiters of Truth, the Lawfare podcast series on our online information ecosystem. You can find past episodes in the Lawfare podcast feed, and we'll be back with another episode next Thursday.
The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. Our audio engineer is Kara Schillen, and our producer is Jen Pache Howell. Please rate and review the Lawfare Podcast in whatever app you use, and consider becoming a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon. As always, thanks for listening.